friends with the equipment here. Seems to be fine. And uh, it was in, uh, I worked with the Lacandone in the kind of near where Charles is uh, working in, in Chiapas and in uh, Trish's uh, presentation this morning reminded me of a, a funny 2012 story. Uh, a couple of years ago when I was you know, slowly getting into this project, I asked the the Lacandon community of Mensabat, a couple of the leaders of the community. So I asked them, so what do you think of uh, 2012? What's the, you know, the, the Hachuinik or the Lacandon perspective? And the elders, there's about five elders, they look back and forth. I'm sitting there anticipating their answer. And the, and the village leader looks at me and says, you're the epigrapher and the archaeologist. You were hoping to tell us what was going to happen in 2012. Uh, so... Um, uh, what I uh, want to talk about today is, uh, I, first I want to thank the uh, Loa, the organizers, for inviting me back when I was here about five years ago. It was right when I was starting uh, the project with the Lacando, uh, starting to look at uh, archaeological sites of, of unconquered Maya. And so today I have a lot more details to, to show you besides kind of maps and the initial kind of chronology that I had then. Uh, I want to talk about today about... Um, uh, yeah, ancestral lands, uh, uh, ritual landscapes, uh, and pilgrimage in in Maya society and with the Lacandon, and mainly what I want to show at the end is that uh, sorry I have a little bit of a cold in case I'm get rid of a cold I've had one for like two months that the um, the, the ritual landscapes were really important as uh, communicating places places for communication still interaction with. Uh, gods or essences, I'd like to call them, or, uh, or ancestors, and that they, they were really important for community identity and, um, and territory. And uh, I draw on uh, Trisha's uh, work uh, on ancestors and ancestor worship in, in the Maya region. So, okay, um, what's interesting, too, is there's been uh, a lot of, of ethnographic research on, on Lacandon Maya for over 100 years, <laughs> And if you read the, the ethnographies, they, they often focus on uh, lock and don't pilgrimage to ritual landscapes or ancestral uh, ritual landscapes. And in fact, when the, the lock and don't appeared on the scene again in, in the late 1940s, was with the discovery of, uh, uh, I didn't want to do that. I think I just turned it off. <laughs> I was looking for the laser. There, the other side, the other way. Um, so when uh, uh, archaeologists heard about some of these archaeological sites in Chiapas and in Peten, because the Lacandon knew where they were, they would take the explorers and the archaeologists in because uh, the Lacandon were still would perform rituals in here. They would burn incense to ancestors and gods, etc. So Bonompak was actually discovered because some uh, the Lacandones had known about the site, and it was a ritual, important ritual uh, pilgrimage site for them. So that's how Bonapak was discovered. And the Lacandon appeared on the scene again, or actually rediscovered. Uh, there's been a lot of research, ethnographic research, on the Lacandon. In fact, uh, when anthropology was first starting as a discipline, some of the earliest ethnographic research or people living in the field with uh, uh, um, peoples of other cultures happened in Chiapas, in the Lacandon region. With Alfred Tauser, he was looking for evidence for Maya hieroglyphic writing. And he got there and saw no Maya hieroglyphic writing with the Lacandon, but said, ah, I'm going to do an ethnography anyway as long as I'm here. So I, I got interested in uh, looking at unconquered, um, unconquered Maya in the rainforest of Peten and Chiapas and, and southern Yucatan because I was working on a project. I was at, on the Dos Pilas project. I've slowly moved westward. I started in Copan as an undergraduate and then went to Peten, Guatemala. Now I'm over at the Usmas in Chiapas. Well, I was uh, uh, doing uh, archaeological research at, at Dos Pilas in Peten uh, on the collapse. Uh, I, I always like to talk to local people about what we're doing and and I told them that you know, I'm studying why this site was abandoned, you know, what happened to the different kind of social strata, so to speak. When were the elites abandoning those pilas, and when did uh, people of the lowest rank, and the poorest people, when did they abandon the site, and what does this tell us about the collapse of the process? And, they, and again, they started looking at each other, and they said, well, there's still a lot of, there's still Maya here up until the 1920s. I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> And they said there they were the Lacandones, and they lived throughout in these, in these small settlements throughout the, the region around those Pilas, and that our grandfathers and used to go hunting with them. 
and uh, we can show you their sites where they used to live. So I almost dropped my dissertation research. <laughs> I got really interested in doing some historical archaeology, but I, but I waited, did my dissertation of those Philists, and then quickly gravitated to looking at unconquered Maya. But what's interesting is that, um, uh, that there is some um, historic information, and there's some documents on people living in unconquered territories, but the, the Spaniards in, you know, of the colonial period and later on Mestizos were fascinated by these people who were uh, living in the rainforest in these autonomous settlements. And this is actually a piece from a Costa painting. Has anybody seen the Costa paintings from Peru? And there's some from Mexico. There's Costa paintings that show peninsular Spaniards at the, the peak of the Costa or the cast. And then all the way down at the bottom are the Barbaros, or the, the indigenous Barbaros, the people that are living in autonomous settlements way up in the middle of the rainforest. And I've actually, there are some early documents that show La Condone in the 19th century. They actually paint them like this, like, like from a Costa painting. Uh, what's uh, interesting here, when you think about the colonial period, uh, and even to the present, what, is, what was controlled by the Spaniards is, was very small. Uh, they controlled the coast, some, some of the, the cities he, uh, here and here. They controlled the coast and, and the highlands, or parts of the highlands. I just killed it again, sorry. Uh, and um, parts of the highlands and the coast, but left these... Uh, in some instances, pockets of resistance, you might say, are really uncontrolled territory, unconquered, uncolonized territory. But there's a vast territory here in Petén, around Tikal, Yashtilan, and into even southern Yucatan that was not controlled, and really in many ways is still not today. Even the village where I work with, they say, well, we're Mexicanos, they have a follower Mexican, but this is our territory. We haven't been conquered. This is ours, and nobody's going to take it away from us. So uh, the site where I'm working is just across the way here from Piedras Negras in Petén over here in, in Chiapas. I'm right up in, in the, one of the last river valleys before you get to the Usamacinta. Uh, right in the Sierras, there's a river valley. Little ripples from the, the highlands here. Right in here is, is, is Mensa Box. So I'm kind of on the edge of this, this vast territory here, but I used to do archaeology here at a historic site uh, in, uh, in Petén. So I got interested in this. Uh, I actually dug some of those historic sites around those Pilas and up even in, into Tikal and found some others that I never uh, had the chance uh, to uh, excavate. And also colleagues now, since I'm one of the people interested in the colonial period uh, in the lowlands, uh, colleagues will periodically say, share with me, Charles has, has done that, to send me artifacts. And we found these lock on Doan incense burners or even these probably colonial period or late colonial period uh, incensarios in structures in, at, at El Sol. So Steve Houston has recently uh, found uh, at the site where he's working. So there's, a, there's some material evidence for people that are, are living out in the unconquered region, living out uh, in, in the bush, but it's not easy to find where they're living. So what I decided to do was, uh, since I knew it was not easy to find uh, the settlements, was to look back at documents. And I realized, OK, this is interesting. All these Spanish entradas going in the region, uh, and even later, people living in, in towns in the highlands in the loans that were developing were mentioning that when they went on these entradas or went on expeditions into the forest, they found people living around lakes. As you can see from this Google Earth photo, there's a lot of, of lakes uh, around the Usmacinta. So Piedras Negras is right back in here, I believe. Um, here's Lake Mensamá right here. Palenque is right out, out of the picture right over here. So we're kind of in, in between Palenque and Bonham Park and up close to, to Piedras Negras. But they say when they came here, there's a lot of lakes and there's people living around them. I thought, wow, this, is, this will provide an opportunity uh, to uh, actually in, uh, decrease my survey territory to find these historic sites, which are usually very small. We don't get the big temples anymore, and no steely, uh, you, you don't really have to stumble upon uh, to find new sites. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, instead of doing big survey blocks or transects, now let's just go to these lakes. They probably attracted human populations over a long period. And here, I bet you I can find some of these historic sites. 
Because I don't know which, uh, when they mention, oh, we found some people at this lake, at Noha, or we found people at Anyate. I don't know which lake they're referring to. Uh, so um, I just picked this one here, eventually, at, at Mensabah. The main reason I picked this one, too, is there's a descendant community. There are still Lacandon living here, whereas on many of these other lakes, they're no longer uh, Lacandon, is a large Lacandon population. So that's another reason why I picked uh, this lake here. Now, what's also neat is I think this one, there was a colonial center and actually a Spanish mission uh, that was abandoned around 1650. I think this is actually Noha, or Great Water. I think this is the site here. And so we're working in a satellite community, a satellite uh, um, a secondary center from this, this greater uh, contact period proto-historic colony here at Lake, uh, Lake Petpa or Noha. All right, so here's Mentabak, a um, really beautiful place to work. It's in a federal reserve with a Lacanon community that owns it and then runs it. And there's a lot of mountains in that over there. There's actually not one lake. There's several lakes that are um, interconnected by rivers or by artificial canals. And I'm on top of one. A uh, major mountain that I'll show you more slides of in a second looking out. Now, part of this really impressive view, remember, impresses everybody, right? It impresses all humans, uh, including Maya uh, worshipers and Maya uh, religious specialists. I'll explain a little bit. Some things to note here are some cliffs coming right out of the water over here. Uh, there's some here. You'll we'll see shots of islands and that. But what I found in the surveys, uh, which we've only started, uh, I've been working here seven years, and I still think I'm only just starting. <laughs> There's just so much here. Is around the lake shore, we'll have, uh, instead of like we saw with Charles's talk, with polys and sites all spread out, we have several different sites around the, the lake. They're not all coalesced into one uh, population. There's one here in this peninsula, for instance. Uh, there's one over here. This one's actually fortified. They cut a canal from this part of the lake all the way over here to protect this peninsula and perhaps these sites as well. Uh, there's a site over here. They all date to roughly the same period, uh, right in the early, early colonial period. This is just uh, some of the, the, the walls and that. See, again, you can see these are sites that are really hard to find. If you're out surveying for them, the rainforest, when you survey in the rainforest, you can't see from here to that wall anyway, <laughs> uh, let alone find a, a, a structure. So, uh, it's easier, well, we have the Lock and Dome collaborators that know where a lot of sites are, but when we just start surveying along the lake, we can find these um, uh, low stone platforms. Now, this, uh, the, the chronology here is interesting, as I'll show you in a little bit, but on that one, there's a one peninsula site that has late pre-classic structures, very large, very interesting uh, uh, constructed buildings uh, around a plaza and then uh, the really interesting thing is on this lake, we have no late classic occupation at all. I've never seen that in my archaeology. I've never seen it. We have late pre-classic, but boom, everybody's gone, and they come back right at the contact period, right at the conquest uh, era around 1400, 1500. But as soon as I, this is the very first site the Lacandon took me to, and the funny thing is it's just like Dos Pilas. <laughs> Dos Pilas was a late classic site with big structures around the plaza, with a terminal classic village inside the plaza. So at about the time of the collapse, the last few remnants of the population held up in the plaza of Dos Pilas and built defensive walls around it. I walk up the, in the peninsula and I look and I see the big plaza and I see the village. You see these structures right here are placed later uh, in the plaza, but um, in a very interesting pattern. It's kind of round here and they put up these defensive walls behind. I think they've actually palisaded this. It's another round kind of fortification here uh, at this site of, of, of Tzibak Na. So again, all these are like contact period buildings that, that are placed in and around pre-classic buildings at Tzibak Na. Uh, the ceramics, and as soon as I picked up the potter and looking, I'm like, I don't know what this is, huh? <laughs> this is really, really interesting. We have new kinds of ceramics uh, because of the interesting period, the uh, very late period. Uh, we have very, but at the same time, some diagnostic, but late pre-contact pottery to early contact period pottery with these plates with uh, the long, elongated nub and feet. 
Um, water jars with figure, figurine heads crudely attached to them. A lot of these um, uh, chachi, thinking in Lacando, <laughs> where you find them, there are more chachis. Colanders, uh, the colanders that uh, appear in the late pre-contact period up, they're still using them up and make them up into the present. Uh, these very interesting uh, solid figurines, all female. Figurines. I've never seen anything like this before with some marks on their face like the Spanish describe the people in the documents from this area is when they get painted up for uh, tattooed for, for ritual as adult uh, women and men adorn their faces this way. Uh, I was hoping to find in our excavations, I was anxious to find more of these because I've never seen anything like this before and understand more about their context and their manufacture. We're only finding them in the lake. We're finding no parts of these female figurines in our excavation at all. We only find them when the lake level goes down, then they peer around the shoreline. Uh, it's probably women uh, for fertility or human health are probably dumping these in, in the lake. It's a really interesting part of the, the shrines. I don't have a, a specific shrine where they're putting, uh, where they're putting these to be more kind of scattered in the lake. Anyway, so there's the pottery that only I would love, I think. <laughs> This is neat. We, we got our dates back. I'd always, from the first time I went there, I'm like, this is it. This is the proto-historic kingdom. I can see it in the architecture. I've seen only a few, but I'm confident in this. But only recently, in the last October, we got our AMS dates back and uh, our radiocarbon dates and show it's very interesting things. I had one radiocarbon date that was uh, uh, 1950 <laughs> in, in, an archaeological, in, in an archaeological context. And what, what this shows is the, the lake was reoccupied right before around 1400, and then in many sites, and then in even the shrines are being used well into the colonial period. And the first mentioning of the Lac Andone in Spanish documents around 1750, 1775, just after kind of some of our, our radiocarbon dates. So I was really looking for a, um, a project area that had a proto-historic uh, uh, population. I didn't care how, how big or how small, but I wanted to see a connection with the uh, contemporary Lac Andone, and, and here we have it. So uh, I work with the community. Uh, um, I've been there for about seven years, and I can only tell from like questions I was getting from people last year that I think, yeah, that trust is, has been built up finally. <laughs> These are really interesting questions on, uh, anyway, on, on, on stuff, children, or et cetera. Uh, one story I wanted to, to share with uh, you today is, as I heard last year, and this will just tell you that this happens almost every day, how much you, you learn. It's like going in and, and opening up a book when you talk to them. I was sitting with a guy enjoying excellent lock and tobacco. I've gotten hooked on lock and don't cigars. Uh, sitting on the structure, looking at a storm coming in, and uh, lightning bolts coming down. And um, and my friend says, "Oh, well, there's more lightning." And he goes, "Yeah, my grandfather told me that uh, lightning bolts leave those chert bifaces and axes that you find in the in the fields and around." I'm like, yeah. I, I responded, yes, I've heard that, and by the way, I've read that the ancient Greeks believe the same thing, that church bifaces or stone axes are, are left uh, in, in the ground. And he said, oh, well, it has to be true. I said, well, what do you mean? Lightning is lightning. He knows it has to have because, my grandfather said, we used to use by, uh, chert bifaces and and cutting tools to cut the brush, the trees, to fell trees. And when lightning hits the ground, it strikes the tree and strikes the branch off or splits the tree in half like an axe. I thought, wow, that is really an interesting explanation. So this is, uh, besides working with the Lac Andone community and, um, and learning from them every day, uh, uh, and, uh, we have a nice place to stay. I'm usually used to roughing it uh, out in a tent or roaming around the uh, the forest, but the really nice uh, camp. There are nice facilities to do to do research. Now, one we uh, it's interesting how uh, you often stumble upon you know these things. You know, learning things from people just having a conversation with a cigar or uh, out doing surveys, and you stumble upon things. But that's the the great fun of archaeology. So we're doing surveys, and um, they started showing me other sites, and one of them was this site 
called Chakak Tun, uh, which means a red hollow stone, a red hollow cave. It's because of this red stain here that faces east. It's a very important ritual mountain and always has been. Uh, this, uh, as you can see, the first time I walked up this, the, the Lacandon with the uh, people who work with them with the federal gov government uh, built a trail up here on the south side of this mountain that gets to the top. And the very first time I walked to the top, I looked, I said, this mountain has been leveled. It's been completely leveled, shaved off the top, and then they used the, the, um, the stone to build a terrace right here and then to build this temple. You can kind of see the blip in the tree. It's, it's been leveled. Uh, you can tell the size of this hill right here is a canoe of Lacandones right, right down here. Base of the of the mountain, so it's very important to remember that this is a hollow mountain with these clefts. So it's a cleft mountain. It's a split mountain, which is really important in Maya lore and Lacandon lore. It's hollow. It's full of caves and, and cenotes. There's a couple of sinkholes on the west side, and on top of the sinkholes there are shrine structures. So all of these caves have shrines and terraces in front of them, and the sinkholes, the cenotes, will have a shrine at the highest point above the cenote. And we're just starting to explore this. Now something really, really, really bothered me for many years uh, while doing surveys around the lake shore. Um, there's one, I went to, uh, Lacano took me to a site here on the north side, which nobody had really explored. He took me to the site, and I was walking around, I said, this is really a strange site. Uh, we walked up in here, and there's a big plaza here. Some of these level areas here is a plaza here, and then this structure, this kind of just a platform with some buildings on it, and there's no habitation at all. There are no house mounds here at all. And there's just plazas, and only one kind of one temple structure right here that's not even pretty high. It's like this is very strange. Okay, and then we've moved on to the next site, and I forgot about it for years. But then, um, then when I went up to map. This, none of my grad students wanted to walk up and down or live on top of this mountain. So I got the, <laughs> I was secretly just crossing my fingers. I want to dig this, this, this ceremonial site up here on the top of this temple. And so when we were mapping this, the, um, uh, some Lacandon informants, as, as they always casually do, they never volunteer a lot of information. They just kind of mention things sometimes. And they said, well, you know that there's a bunch of, st of what we call steps. Uh, all the way down this north side of the mountain. I'm like, what? You didn't tell me this seven, you know, the last seven years? You took me down to these sites and we're up here? And, you, and so, well, we figured you might want to map them since you're up here. <laughs> and as soon as they told me, as soon as they said there are terraces going down there, I said, do those terraces go down to that site uh, that you showed me like seven years ago? They're like, yeah. <laughs> what it is, is it's a... It's a pilgrimage, it's a monumental pilgrimage shrine, a pilgrimage site, a monumental one. Uh, you would gather in the site here at the, the north side of the mountain at the base, and you would climb up. Um, here's the first terrace here with some altars. So imagine people coming up right here is the stairway, providing your offerings, and this, this temple right here. And then after that, you go up 13. There's 13 levels up to the top. So it really represents the 13, they're not really levels, they're 13 compartments where you have 13 different gods or 13 different people or ancestors associated with them. So you'd climb up these terraces. Now it's interesting, first the terraces go east to west with the path of the sun. And then it, on the west, it, you have the cave at the last terrace right here. There's a cave, so I imagine maybe you thought the sun was setting in a cave. And then the terraces then hook and go straight south, run north-south. So it's very, very very oriented towards the cardinal points. So you have all these terraces. I mean, up all the way up to the 13th one here, and then you take the steps up to the top of the leveled mountain where there's just a temple and a very, very large vertical cave shaft, very impressive vertical cave. It's a hollow mountain. It's a mountain of sustenance, a mountain of everything that people need. Now, a couple of things that I want to show is the, there are large boulders on the way up. There's a boulder that had fallen off the, the top part here in the cleft or something and rested on the side of the mountain. They built a shrine around it. There's a, a, a plaza in front of it, and then there's an altar on top of it and a shrine where they're providing offerings there. I already mentioned the cave, and right on top of that, there's an altar on this cave. 
And then again, the terraces, the final terraces up to the top of the, uh, of the summit of Chalkout Tomb. Now what's neat is, again, I mentioned the 13 levels. Uh, this is very important in my architecture, even in uh, Bloom and Lafarge found one just nearby us, near Tony Na, a mountain. This is not a temple, it's a modified mountain with 13 terraces or 13 levels. And a lot of architecture, of course, and as if they have royal tombs in their tombs, they have nine levels for the nine compartments of the, uh, of the underworld. Well, the 13 is more of the level, layer of the earth and then up into the sky. So this reminded me of you know, major pilgrimage sites around the world, especially in Asia. I think China, Tibet, with all your plazas and places where pilgrims can stay and, and gather. There's not much habitation. They're just, people are just resting in the streets or resting around these buildings and then go up to the mountain. Uh, and even there you see pil uh, pilgrims or people resting there as well. Very much like that. Now, um, the, the constructions that we map there, the terraces, the top, all the modifications of the mountain is late pre-classic. And I think all the terraces and the, and the, the site with the plazas is also a late pre-classic. And this is a late pre-classic mural from San Bartolo that I interpret as a evidence of pilgrimage. Uh, these two figures who the investigators say are probably historic individuals that um, they're not sure probably exactly how they play into the scene of the maze god. The maze god is providing food, and that for maybe attendants here. Uh, I think these are pilgrims coming in with offerings. There's historic individuals coming in with offerings to the maze god who has to be contacted at his mountain, at his hollow mountain. Uh, he comes out of the, or this essence will come out of the, of the cave. These attendants, I, I, uh, it's possible they might be ancestors, energies of ancestors that, that as I'll argue eventually, that help people, uh, your ancestors help you interact with these divine energies. They, they intercede on your behalf. I think it's possible that that's what these individuals might, might represent. Now, the, the evidence for pilgrimage, as I get into in my book, I talk about foot and hand prints. Look at these feet prints. They don't come out of the cave. They come into the cave. See that? These feet are leading us. These pilgrims are walking to the cave. Now, what's really, really, this gets better. <laughs> what's really, really neat about Chakotun, this mountain, is it's not only a mountain. It's a mountain on an island in the middle of this beautiful lake. What does this sound like to you? Atzlan. It is the, really, the prototypical, the quintessential sacred place in Mesoamerican societies is this island in the middle of a beautiful lake that has a mountain that's associated with the ancestors. Your people come from this hollow mountain. They come from this, this site. So if you even look at, it very much looks like, now I'm not saying I found out salon. <laughs> Boy, that would be neat. Uh, but I'm just suggesting there are many sites like Atzlan throughout Mesoamerica. Everybody wanted to, you know, have a really important, and I even argue, pilgrimage center that would then relate to the ancestors and where you came from, the place where you came from. And this is really is, this beautiful place is like an Atzlan. It is for the Lacandon. Um, when we were up there clearing, for mapping and looking on the, and we would find Lacandon incensarios, incense burners. And I said, oh, this is interesting. It was this guy, Juan, right here, said, well, we would come up here before because we would need help with healing people. Uh, we would come and we would leave the, leave the incensarios and, and burn incense, leave offerings, so that the, the essences um, really didn't describe, I'll have to pin him down on that, he, the, the gods or the essences would help their community and they would have to leave those incensarios as the incense burners as part of the payment for the help in, in healing people. So they still, uh, here's some of the incensarios here. Here's a very early one. I thought this was post-classic before. It's late pre-classic. It's a late pre-classic incensario. And so we have the late pre-classic one from the summit and then some Lacandon ones uh, at the same time. Uh, they took me to other shrines around the lake a lot of these shrines have our cliffs coming out of the water with rock art, abundant rock art. This one, the Lacandon, called Zibatna. That's Zibatna, which is like the, writ, uh, the painted writing house. 
And you see there's rock art here. We've started to analyze. And some of these are very recent, by the way, probably within the last 500, 400 years. Uh, starting to do different kinds of photography or playing with the images. And Sibat Na, or the house of the painted writing, actually has a painted hieroglyphic panel on it. You can kind of see in this photo, there's an arm right here. Maybe you can't. Just kind of light and a head right here. But here you can see the head, with the late priest classic style headdress. Uh, the hands are two people walking in the same direction. I think they're arriving at this site, or maybe Chakak Tun, uh, and providing offerings. These are late pre classic figures with the late pre classic shrine. The text is probably at the end of the late pre classic and early classic period. It's kind of uh, tacked up right in front of the face of this main larger figure right here. Not too many things discernible, maybe a tab or tabai glyph right here for dedication. Uh, other, we have to do more, more work on that inscription. What I want to get at here, it's interesting that it's called the, the site of the painted writing, and, and yet and, and this panel is here. You'll see there's other, other evidence that the Lakan Don have preserved evidence from the past related to these shrines. And this is one bit of evidence here. Now, what's really neat is when I go here with the Lacandon, we're studying this, they tell me that they used to come here, provide offerings uh, to this shrine, and to ask for agricultural abundance, and uh, that there also is a snake underneath that's related to this shrine and these rituals. Now, there's a snake under there, under the water. Yeah, there's a snake under there. I go, what kind of snake? Is it on the cliff? Or they're like, yeah, it's on the cliff. But it never appears. So what do you mean it never appears? I said, well, it's down in there, down in the water. And I just left at that. Well, a couple of years ago, I went down, and the water level had gone down 15 meters. It dropped 15 meters. It was a particularly bad dry season. And the snake appeared. <laughs> and it, uh, so you can see up here, here's where we were. I'm studying these paintings. And you, you're starting to get maybe an idea of the scale of this snake. This isn't, they, they said, oh, una culebrita. There's a little snake or con. And, and this is a monumental feathered serpent. So this here, so there's probably been other carvings in that on this cliff. There's been carvings here for a long period. Probably the, the figures with the hieroglyphic text and the pre-classic. Then you have the historic Maya coming in and, and drawing. And then the... Probably the proto-historic, the late post-classic people put this uh, feathered serpent in, uh, uh, carved it on the cliff. But they knew it was going to be underwater again. They carved it instead of painting it. What I think was happening is some, uh, uh, there's some dry spells perhaps right at the contact period, about 1500. Uh, this is kind of shows that, or at least they had enough time to uh, a couple of years or more where this was down, where they could plan out these serpent carvings and then, and then actually render them on the cliffs. They had plenty of time for that. So there is some evidence that it was dry around the lake, which probably attracted people here, though, right? I mean, it's probably dry, but there's still enough water in the lake for people to come and, and, and have access to water to live on the lake. Also, these kinds of feathered serpents are in other cliffs around in the Maya region. I just showed a few. And ethnographically, they're often associated with water serpents. Uh, for rituals to bring back, back rain or to have rains continue. There's another interesting shrine over here on this cliff that uh, comes out of the lake uh, that you can see again from Chakak Tomb. So I'm looking due north, northwards, a northern direction, which is important in this case. So there's this northerly shrine here. Other interesting stuff around, even this island has a shrine on it. Uh, the, on, the, on that cliff, there are these handprints. Uh, with the palms pecked out of the handprints, and I think it's touching, touching the rock and having the essences, the sacra going into the into the person. Uh, footprints around another, not on this Mensabak cliff, but there are footprints on on another uh, cliff, and then there's another lake nearby that has a cliff that has handprints and footprints. That's important in, in Maya caves and rock shelters. Otherwise, we see footprints and handprints. Uh, on them, I say these are pilgrims' marks. Uh, throughout the world, pe uh, throughout the world, people going to pilgrimage shrines are touching uh, sacra. They're touching the shrines. Uh, they're leaving their feet impressions, or they'll say that um, the footprints that we see in these sacred monuments at our shrines are show the presence of deity 
or presence of spiritual essences that we want to contact. So that's what I argue is happening the same thing in, in the Maya region, in Mesoamerica, and in Mensa Bach. And another example of this, just one, there's many, but one at Chalcatzingo, which has pre-classic um, populations, burials, but then handprints and artifacts all the way up to the contact period as well. It's a major pilgrimage shrine. And that explains why all these people were going there and why you get a so-called kind of international market there. Uh, at this gateway city. It's a pilgrimage shrine. Some of the things are these enigmatic footprint uh, seals. I think they're stamps. So people come in, they could stamp on their clothing or stamp on their skin or stamp something with the footprint uh, if they went on a pilgrimage. And the handprints all over the, the rocks as well are, um, are signs of that. So the one Mensa Bach cliff is interesting because it has many, many individuals uh, of skeletal remains on the rock shelter at the base of the cliff. So you have all those paintings, uh, uh, handprints and other paintings ab uh, above it, and the shrine is full of human bone, and even uh, the Lacandon have been bringing, uh, the last couple of generations have brought uh, their dead here when they change sites or move sites, they'll bring their dead here, and they bring their so-called dead incensarios, the incense burners that uh, either are from a dead father or grandfather or they do the incense uh, burner renewal ceremony, and those old ones are dead. They have to be de excuse me, deposited in, in this shrine where you have human bone. Okay? I argue that this is, a, this is to the northernmost point of the lake and of the shrines. I think this is a place of the dead that is found to the north. Uh, another cave up in that cliff, uh, we have mummy bundles. Uh, we have, in some of those bones I just showed you, and the, the burials you see part of in this cave shrine up on the cliff still have hair. They have some hair. They have uh, tendons. And um, what was happening here is the people would uh, come in, um, and they would sit down on this wooden bench. This is probably contact period, by the way, probably the late post-classic or into the early co colonial period shrine. But they would come in here, and they would converse. They would communicate with these ancestors. They would communicate with these individuals, much like you see in other parts of, of Mesoamerica. Uh, like here at, uh, in uh, Highland Oaxaca, you get people going on pilgrimages. Again, the footprint, see the, foot, the feet traveling to the cave, and here's the, the ancestor or the ancestor oracle that would then speak to the pilgrim. The same thing was happening at Mensa Bach. Now, up on that cliff where you, we have all those human remains, uh, that most of them date to the proto-historic times and historic times and, and even uh, Lacandon burials. We have probably a, probably a contact period painting. It might be earlier. It's really hard to date this stuff. But since the material on the shrine dates to the contact period, I believe most of the paintings up uh, above the cliff, above the shrine, date to the, the, the contact period. Anyway, what we have are two individuals that are that have come and arrived somewhere, probably the shrine, have, are sitting down and are gesticulating. They have their hands out, maybe they're providing offerings. And in front, we have this kind of individual who might be an ancestor, a god, or a mummy. Might be one of these individuals sitting inside the cave. What's really interesting, if you look, they're, um, they're painted in, they're polychrome. This, this is polychrome rock art that we have here. Uh, these individuals are in red. The main body of this mummy or ancestor is in red with kind of a darker red or black face. And look at this yellow or orange es essence that is coming forth from this person. Uh, almost like we saw with the eccentric flints with the central character and these other essences uh, coming out of it. Uh, coming forth here, I think these people have arrived to the shrine and are communicating with the ancestors that you see in these essences that come out and then, and then communicate or speak to uh, the pilgrims. Another painting on this cliff shows this right here. And as soon as I saw this in, uh, in person and in a publication, so that's Tlaloc that's holding one of those hand stones or water jar with water coming out, uh, just like you'd see in, in contact period codices throughout Mexico. It's Tlaloc. But who is Tlaloc? Well, Tlaloc is a rain god, a storm god. Uh, that is associated with the dead. It is the god that manages uh, Tlalocan, uh, or the place of the dead, the place of the ancestors. 
Well, in you ask the Lakan Don today, or you can read any ethnography when the Lakan Don are interpreting this shrine, and the Lakan Don say, "Oh, this is our god Mensabak. Uh, Mensabak is the god of of storms and lightning, of conflict, and he manages the uh, or it manages the place of the souls of the dead. It's Tlaloc. It's the same deity." So what I'm interpreting is, is Mensabak, this northerly most shrine, is the entrance then to that uh, um, otherworldly paradise where all the souls go to. You ask the Lakandon what happened to, uh, at Mensabak, what happened when, to people and their souls when they die? Because people have many different kinds of souls. They don't have just one. They say, well, the, the main soul from the heart and the head goes across the lake, goes through Tsibatna, through that panel with the hieroglyphs, and then the souls go through, that's the doorway, and then they go to the Mensabak shrine, and they live inside that mountain or inside that cliff, and there they stay happily uh, uh, ever after. This is depicted throughout Mesoamerica in our, uh, these uh, otherworldly paradises of the dead that are associated with abundance. Uh, they have plenty of food. They have plenty of water. Uh, they're very happy. And we have here an archaeological example of Tlalocan or and Tamo and Cha. A couple other uh, shrines at the at the nearby lake. Uh, we haven't actually got to to do any work yet. I want to get a grad student involved in this lake at Yahalpetha. Uh, there's shrines here that the Lakandon also visited that have human remains or remains of ancestors. Uh, they perform rituals here. As you can see, these Lakandon god pots right here. Um, here, there's these contact period burials. We know from the pottery and uh, the kind of the skull shaping, which is interesting. We radiocarbon dated some of the, the skeletons that have skull shaping all the way into six, 1650. It did not stop in the colonial period. It is still performing head shaping here. But the important thing to remember is, is the colonial period was something that was not on the mind of these people. <laughs> these are unconquered people in autonomous territories, all kinds of artifacts, um, um, rituals that continue well into the colonial period where, where I'm working. One of these shrines is called Itzanoku. And they say that is the, the Lakandon say at this shrine we go interact with ancestors and we interact with gods to stop the water. To stop, we get too much groundwater, like we're getting down Chicago. <laughs> got to perform some rituals for Itzanoku to turn the stick it off because Doing these rituals is not just to bring rain, it's to control the amount of rain. So when they're getting too much, they go to Itzanoku, this cliff with, again, with uh, human burials uh, to perform ceremonies. Now what's interesting, they say Itzanoku is the god of lakes and crocodiles. Uh, it's the same as Itzamna, or Itzamkabain, an uh, aspect of Itzamna. So what if this, like Mensa Bach Shrine and like the Tzibat Na Shrine, they, the Lakandon have preserved these ideas of what these shrines were used for at, for at least 500 years, if not more. And it's interesting, when they take you around the lake, um, when they want to show tourists, and they often don't go to like all the archaeological sites, uh, they'll take you to their shrines. Uh, They'll, uh, they'll tell you about others, and what they're really doing is they're telling you this is our territory. Our ancestors are here. You can see it in the rock art. You can see it in the burials. We used to, our, our grandparents used to communicate here. We used to come here and provide offerings in order to get bountiful harvests or to be uh, cured from illnesses. So I think that these sites and others throughout Mesoamerica uh, are these ancestral ritual landscapes that are really important for communication. I picked up on some of these ideas from Miguel Lastor Aguilera's book on, on Maya communicating objects. It's all about communication. And so they go to these places on these pilgrimages to communicate with uh, 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 spiritual forces, what we would call gods, to try to maintain the balances in their lives and again get bountiful harvests and and have happy, healthy children, and be cured of diseases, uh, and the like. And the only way to maintain this balance is to go to communicate with them, the gods, at their houses. So places like Chinkulti, Chiapas, guess what? You find a lot of burials. These are all burial shrines here, human burials. In the, in the cliff walls here, hu uh, excuse me, human burials. What is going on here in this communication is, again, 
the, the communication with the supernatural forces is much better if you have somebody on your side. That's why you bury the ancestors there, the people who are living in the other world. You can communicate with them, draw them out through ritual, give them the message, and then they, they pass it on. And then they will bring messages to you. Uh, the, so that maintains these covenants with earth and rain and maintains the cosmic balance. Now it's important also for community and territory. Uh, these kinds of shrines pick up when there's stress, environmental stress or political uh, and social stresses. In the area where I'm working at Mensa Bach, there's a big spike in these shrines when the Spanish are conquering around the communities around the area. Uh, and so what they want is kind of increased communication with, with the supernatural world through the ancestors so that they can kind of write, uh, write this balance. Another thing is when you put ancestors in caves and you're putting them in different shrines around your community, you are staking a claim on territory. You're showing Spaniards and other Maya moving in the area that this is yours. Your ancestors are buried here. This is your territory. This is where we get everything from our community from. This is ours. So, so. Okay, I'm going to end there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, this is such a wonderful presentation. I'm, I know we're running over. Please indulge me for a few more minutes. But if there's a, one or two questions for Joel, I don't want to miss that opportunity. The work is really quite great to see. Okay, well, I'll let you have a seat. Um, please. <laughs>